All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll call this meeting to order. And as uh, we have been doing in the past, my fellow council members will be teleconferencing in. And uh, let us all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Here we go. If you put your hands over your hearts, please. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of, America of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. If you'd give us the roll call, please. Ms. Rodriguez? Councilmember Engler? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bill De La Pena? Present. Mayor Adam? And I'm here as well. And uh, at per usual, the city attorney and the city manager and myself are eight feet apart, if not even a little further, so we have taken our masks off, but I can assure you we wore them in, we'll wear them out, and we wear them as we're walking around the, the uh, building here. All right, uh, we do have a request for continuance. It looks like the um, item 8A, the leaf dispensary, has been continued to a date uncertain. May I get a motion for that continuance, please? I'll so move. All right, thank you. And uh, if we could have a vote on that, please. We're doing a voice vote, right? Okay. Councilmember Angler? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bill De La Pena? Yes. Mayor Adam? And that's yes for me as well. And that motion carries 4 0. All right, thank you. Now let us go to Mr. Powers for our COVID 19 update. Thank you, uh, Mayor Adam. Um, we're going to have a relatively brief update uh, this evening, as I'm sure. Um, most folks are tracking things fairly closely uh, in the news, uh, given the coverage. Um, the uh, COVID-19 situation in Ventura County has devolved uh, pretty substantially in the last two weeks. Um, there continues to be significant concern amongst our uh, local public health leadership. Um, just to give you a sense on numbers um, as to, to where things uh, stand tonight, um, we in total, uh, we've now have uh, 3,858 cases. Uh, that's an increase of um, almost 1,700 cases uh, since my update two weeks ago, just to give you a, a frame of uh, how the numbers are uh, growing. Um, we now have 50 fatalities. That's seven additional deaths in two weeks. And a total of 76,400 tests uh, have now been performed across all the testing sites. Uh, the area of most substantial concern uh, is in the um, hospitalizations and those in ICU within hospitals. Um, uh, today we have 79 individuals hospitalized across the county. Uh, and 31 of those uh, are in the intensive care unit. And just to... Uh, to give you a sense, that's an increase of 28 hospitalizations in uh, two weeks and an increase in 17 in the ICU in two weeks. It's a big concern. Um, that's the main uh, focus is uh, to try to control the spread in particular to, to um, protect those that are most vulnerable, but to, to also protect our hospitals in that capacity. Um, uh, VCMC, Ventura County Medical Center, we understand is already in surge capacity right now. Uh, Los Robles uh, remains stable. I was in contact with their leadership today. Um, they obviously are dealing with COVID patients as all hospitals uh, are uh, across the county, but uh, Ventura County Medical Center is the, the uh, most inundated right now in, uh, in the county. These are by far the highest hospitalizations and ICU rates that we've had in Ventura County during this pandemic, and it should be a cause for concern uh, for, for everyone. Um, numbers are tracking uh, across the state uh, in uh, the, the highest percentage increases that we've seen uh, since the, the beginning of the pandemic. And so uh, this uptick is concerning, it's worrisome, 
and uh, we just ask everyone to be uh, really extra vigilant and mindful and thoughtful and understand that there, there is uh, actively spreading virus across uh, Ventura County. Um, we're also in the same arm continuing to work to try to support businesses through grant programs, uh, affected businesses through the reopening process and managing a closure process that went into effect over July 4th weekend for some aspects of those businesses. Uh, it's a it's a huge challenge for our business community to have uh, have to throttle up and throttle down and then for our city staff to have to try to support them the number one thing we can do for our economy and for our businesses uh, right now is to try to control to try to control the virus so that we can get back to a place where we can continue to advance these reopenings so uh, I just ask that uh, when you're out and about uh, there is a state order on masks and you're visiting businesses um, please be be thoughtful about that and uh, try to contribute and do uh, and do your part. Um, there's a lot of folks working on the front lines uh, to to try to combat the virus, and um, we certainly want to uh, to keep people safe and to keep our economy moving forward. Uh, as I always state at the end of uh, my comments, uh, vcemergency.com uh, is the resource where data is up updated daily. Those that need testing have access to testing free of charge locations across the county. Uh, the county's working very hard to shorten the time frame for receiving those results, uh, working to provide text message access to those results, and um, uh, they're uh, continuing to focus on that. Their testing capacity has ramped up substantially. Last week saw some records uh, for daily tests, so there's a lot of volume flowing through those testing sites. And uh, if you need access to where those are and how you can get to them, vcemergency.com is the, the best place to uh, best place to go. Uh, that will conclude my update tonight, Mayor Adam. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Yeah, uh, as you can see, we have gone a little bit backwards on our number of cases. Not all that unexpected, but uh, it's happening nonetheless. Uh, as I make my way around town, which is really on a limited basis under the circumstances, I do see the use of face coverings to be fairly universal at this point, so please keep that up. It's the only thing that we can do as individuals, or one of the things we can do as individuals to, to stop the spread of this virus. And keep your distance from others and, and stay away from those large gatherings. That seems to be a, um, a hot spot. Uh, family gatherings in the backyard, barbecues, that kind of things. It just, uh, we, gotta, we gotta forgo that for now because we wanna see you protected and we wanna see your family members and your residents protected, so. And then as Mr. Powers mentioned, this has been tough on our local businesses, so support them when you can. Uh, it means a lot to them and their survival and in, in, into the future, so. Mr. Mayor. Oh yes, Councilmember Jones, how are you? Yeah, but May I ask a question of the uh, city manager? I couldn't quite hear the la your last few remarks. Uh, did you uh, mention where uh, Thousand Oaks stands in the county in relationship to the new cases and and hospital ICU deaths, et cetera? So the the data is um, uh, the data is not broken out in, on hospitalizations and ICUs um, in that way. But could you speak just a little louder, please? Sure, uh, Councilmember Jones. The data is not broken out uh, for hospitalizations and ICUs um, by city, um, but in terms of uh, in terms of cases. Um, Thousand Oaks has 390 cases um, uh, attributed to the total and Oak Park, which we sort of, while unincorporated, we consider adjacent to us, has 36 uh, cases. I see. Well, I don't do a lot of moving around the city right now, but uh, I don't really see gatherings anywhere. I, I, I think our residents are being uh, very cooperative as far as I can tell in social distancing and wearing masks. I, I, I think it's just very unfortunate that we seem to be having this surge right now. It's hard for me to understand. You know, you seem to do everything right and and still you have a problem doesn't, it doesn't seem quite fair, but uh, that's the way it is, I guess. 
If, if I might add, um, you know, we do have, the county does have a, a contact tracing teams. Uh, they have about 100 folks that are working in that capacity. And when you are uh, um, test positive, those folks are in touch with you and they are the ones that help run to ground the contacts that you've had. Um, in in um, a number of cases, um, as Mayor Adam mentioned, these are rooting back to gatherings. And some of those are gatherings that occurred around graduations, around Memorial Day, and other types of, of gatherings. A lot of them family-oriented gatherings. Some of those are, are parties. And um, that, uh, that is, uh, is happening. Um, there are uh, numerous other uh, avenues of uh, of spread, but I think the uh, the main focus is uh, the virus is 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 highly contagious. There is a lot of new research that public health officials are focused on right now that indicates the virus has mutated in a way that makes it increasingly contagious, uh, easier to spread, and so uh, that's certainly a uh, cause for for a concern and, and really calls for everyone to just practice that vigilance. Thank you. Yeah, as far as these gatherings go, it only takes one person in a gathering of 10 or 12 people in your backyard, and that could be the big difference. So it's uh, wise to just forgo those for now. And, and Mr. Powers, our, our uh, testing sites are, uh, we have one in Newbury Park, I believe. Uh, yes, there is a, a location um, that is at the Newberry Park Branch Library. There's also locations across the county. Um, VC Emergency has a little map up there where you can, uh, can see the locations. Some of those are walk-in locations, others are drive-through locations. Uh, Moore Park College has a drive-through location, Ventura College has a drive-through location, and so those are sometimes more convenient and comfortable for folks to, to just drive in and wait and not have to get out of the car. To, uh, describe the Newberry location is that um, drive-through uh, that location is a uh, walk-in location it's a walk state in. run location uh, and so you you come in and, and receive the test and go out another door and is that open um, what what are the hours do you happen to know uh, I'll have to look it up really quick it's they uh, those hours are up on the VC emergency okay. uh, website all right but Very I will good. take a look and, and uh, confirm for you so if you want to get tested, you could do it as close as Newbury Park. Okay, let us move on now to the consent calendar. Uh, do we have anything to poll? Mayor, Let's public comment. Uh, I think I heard Mayor Pro Tem first. Oh, no, I beg your pardon. I missed public comments. Doggone. I'm gonna get that right. Okay. Let us announce public comments, Ms. Rodriguez. This is a time and place for public comments for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the Council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the Council unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the City Manager for administrative follow-up. Seven individuals have requested to speak and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Well, first up from Canaro Rec and Park District, we have Mr. George Lang. Thank you and good evening, Mayor Adams and honorable council members. As noted, my name is George Lang and I happen to be the chair uh, this year of uh, CRPD. And it's my pleasure to, along with uh, all the park uh, and rec districts in the nation uh, to announce that the month of July is uh, Parks and Recreation Month. And hopefully uh, you all received a little flyer that talks about uh, six different uh, items that make um, your local park district uh, one of the best in the country. Uh, we are strong, we are confident, we are selfless, we are passionate, we are driven, and we are essential. We are strong, but what makes us stronger is the great participation with our fellow local government agencies like the city and Canal Valley Unified District. And we all work together uh, to face whatever challenges that the community has been presented with. The community 
has a level of civic management and public participation, which allows CRPD staff and volunteers to work uh, with the residents, businesses, and community institutions in uh, common cause and achieve great success. Uh, we have a number of great successes locally. Uh, recently, uh, Sopwe Trails uh, was one. Um, our Safe Passage Program that um, deals with at-risk children. We are confident. We are confident for a number of reasons, including having been recognized by national and state level organizations as a top rec and park district. We have built a robust recreation and park and open space system with over 60 parks and facilities, plus our association with COSCA, the partnership with the city we manage approximately 15,000 acres of open space and 150 miles of multi-use trails. Plus every year, normally, uh, we offer thousands of recreation programs and dozens of community events. But as you know, COVID-19 has impacted uh, those efforts. We hire future leaders, smart, young adults, to work with our kids in programs and create confidence and well-adjusted youth selfless in our city needs if our city needs something we jump in and try our best to meet those needs this happens in uh, it happened in the aftermath uh, of borderline and the fires and now during this pandemic of covid-19 we have to continue to main and update the uh, operate the parks and uh, have offered summer day camps to support working families. We work hard to bring at-risk youth uh, into productive programs. We serve senior meals and we offer homework clubs in the low income areas. Passionate, we are passionate. Uh, we care deeply about our environment in the natural sense and in the way one's surroundings and experiences shape the human spirit. We serve our community by offering well-maintained parks and trails, as well as a quality enriching and fun programs as, at reasonable fees. We have wonderful dedicated staff that are passionate about their jobs and how their work and can enrich the quality of life uh, for those participants. George, in many programs. George, uh, I, George, I wanna thank you so much for your service on Canaya Rec and Park Board. You've devoted many, many years and you've been a wonderful addition to that board and thank you for that um, report this evening. Next up we have Deborah Baber. Deborah? And we're gonna move on from Deborah to Judy Bruce. Okay, can you hear me? We got you, Judy, hi. Oh. Hi, hi. Okay, um, the surge, the so-called surge in case numbers are inflated and meaningless. The deaths have dropped. There is no emergency. The hospital numbers are due to, uh, they're taking in people from south of the border. The case numbers do not mean sick or have infections. The tests are inaccurate. They cannot detect a virus. Some are tested more than once and counted again. Even people who are not tested are counted as tested positive. Here's a tweet from Texas. My parents' friends went to get tested. They waited in line for two hours and then decided to leave without getting tested. Hours later, they got a phone call saying they tested positive. This is an epidemic of false testing. The entire charade of, quote, cases. Statistics is theater not science. And why did public health official Vargas ignore my request to provide context to his meaningless data comparison chart? Very telling. Now, let's blow the whistle off of contact tracing, shall we? Is contagion a myth? Well, ever wonder why they have to stick a Q-tip up your nose to the back of your head to swab a sample of COVID but a droplet of saliva will infect a whole village at one time. In 1910, tens of thousands, millions died from the so-called Spanish flu, but there was never any evidence that there was a contagion. And even though there were flu-like symptoms, 
The 1918 radio wave era meant that the electrical field of the Earth was very much disturbed, and along with that, the electrical circuits in the human body. And of course, Western medicine ignores the electrical nature of living things. And also, by the way, millions died from forced vaccinations. Public health officials really wanted to prove that the Spanish flu was contagious. They tried to infect 100 healthy volunteers by collecting mucus from the noses, throats, and upper respiratory tracts of those who were sick. They transferred these secretions to the noses, mouths, and lungs of the volunteers, but not one of them got sick. Blood of the sick donors was injected into the blood of the volunteers, but they remained stubbornly healthy. Finally, they instructed those afflicted to breathe and cough over the volunteers, but none of them became sick. The Spanish flu was not contagious, and it's a fact up to this day there has been no observable experimental studies proving that the influenza is ever transmitted from person to person by normal contact. All attempts to make it contagious have failed. In fact, each new electromagnetic technology was accompanied by a significant flu pandemic, and each time the public was hoaxed by phony attempts at vaccines by Big Pharma who knew they wouldn't work. Thank you, Judy. So, Thank you very much. And we're going to go to Dolores now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'll just uh, begin. In 1965, scientists identified the first human coronavirus. It was associated with the common cold. As the news of deaths in China began to saturate every form of media 24-7, we became familiar with a new term, COVID-19. To be clear, the government media basically relabeled the existing SARS coronavirus, which is short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The symptoms are fever, cough, chest pain, and shortness of breath, which form the diagnosis of the alleged new COVID-19. Calls for testing was declared, but the tests became problematic for a variety of reasons. First, those test kits developed by the CDC had a defect. The testing agent reacted negatively to the genetic material, which made the test inaccurate and the kits unusable. Plus, the kits are clearly marked not for diagnosis purposes. Second, thousands of test kits were contaminated with the SARS viruses. Would the test return a false positive, driving up the numbers so those in power could implement stronger lockdowns and increase unemployment rates? Mandatory testing of what? It is claimed that testing is important to assess if their mitigation efforts, such as shelter in place and social distancing, and wearing a mask are making a difference to flatten the curve. Officials also claim that testing is necessary to know how many persons are infected within a community and to understand the nature of how the coronavirus is spread. Well, I don't consent to be a test rat, frankly. Are these reasons sufficient to give up our health freedom and our personal rights, being tested and shamed in public. Despite the problems with test kits, testing began. By the end of March 2020, more than one million people had been tested across the U.S. The call for mandatory testing has been gathering steam and becoming ever more onerous. But what do the results really mean? Who should be tested? High priority is one category with symptoms, hospitalized patients, healthcare facility workers and residents in long-term care facilities. The second category, priority, persons with symptoms or without symptoms for any reasons. That means virtually everyone can be required to take a test. Is that not a violation of our personal rights? And if you submit to testing, what does a positive test actually mean? Thank you, Dolores. Thank you very much. And next up, we have Lorena Saruwatari. Lorena? 
I'm here. There we are. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, probably behind the global nursing home disaster in the case numbers come. Scandal, tragedy, ongoing crime. In nursing homes, elderly people are suffering from long-term illnesses and year of toxic medical treatments. But now you terrify them with COVID propaganda. Can you actually level them COVID without no justification? Can you isolate them completely? They are all alone, no contact with family and friends. What do you expect will happen to these fragile, heavily drugged people? By funding on the pandemic, an unproven claim of having discovered a new virus, diagnostic tests which are worthless, but open the door to the phony escalation of case numbers, the gathering and crawling of people who have different traditional diseases, perhaps a new, a few new non-viral conditions under the meaningless umbrella term COVID-19, the plan to introduce a toxic vaccine as a solution. There are two con jobs going on, he on here, as huge numbers of these elderly patients have died and are dying. The first is the COVID-19 diagnosis, which is either made on the absurd basis of simply eyeballing the patient and seeing general signs of illnesses such as shortness of breath and flu-like symptoms, or by test, which I have explained is completely unreliable because you register positive on all sorts of germs in the body that are irrelevant. But once the COVID diagnosis is made, the medical authorities claim the death of so many patients in nursing homes are occurring because COVID virus naturally has more impact on the elderly and infirm. Nonsense, there is no need to invoke the coronavirus to explain why these people in nursing homes are dying. That's filthy condition in some facilities plus inattention and outright brutality on the part of nursing homes staff, as breathing ventilation, ventilators and sedation in some cases. Not a virus, no need to invoke a virus as an explanation, no need at all. Obviously, if you subtracted all the deaths from an official COVID statistic, you will have a completely different picture of the so-called pandemic. You will have a worldwide nursing home disaster but because of the fake COVID diagnosis immediately leads to locking down the facilities, friends and families can come in. They are shut out. For the planners of this fall pandemic, it all works out. COVID deaths, numbers rise, deaths number rise, only numbers to the core. But real and tragic deaths, people push into deaths by the concocted idea of a virus, a story about a virus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, next up is Stephanie Sellers. Good evening and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, testing is fraught with serious problems. Testing for COVID-19 has serious problems such as testing cannot directly detect any virus. The PCR or polymerase chain reaction test and antibody testing can only test for respiratory remnants and effects caused by our immune systems. These are assumed to be viral in origin. This is stated by experts as well as the documentation for the test kits, which states, quote, not for diagnostic purposes. The test results, including the antibody tests, are not sufficiently viable. They are all flawed, just estimates and based on physician opinion. Many of these tests do not work or are, inac are, are inaccurate for mass screening with 50% risk of false positives. An unknown number of test kits are contaminated with the SARS-2 virus, thus bringing into question the very motivation of mass testing. Was it to spread the disease, like the American colonists providing smallpox-laden blankets to decimate the Native American populations? There are dissenting professional voices. A growing number of dissenting professional voices, far too numerous to list here, are questioning all aspects of this pandemic from the highly qualified epidemiologist, Professor John at Leonidas. The current coronavirus disease, COVID-19, has been called a once in a century pandemic, but it must also be a once in a century evidence fiasco. The data collection so far on how many people are infected and how the epidemic is evolving are utterly unreliable. Reasonable estimates, estimates a case fatality ratio in the general U.S. population vary from 0.05% to 1%. In 
if that is the true rate, locking down the world with potentially tremendous social and financial consequences may be totally irrational. Pressure is on people to be wearing masks in what amounts to be a mass humiliation ritual, representing the quashing of free speech, the muzzlement of humanity. This is even through the clinical research shows that constant wearing of masks is more likely to cause infections, with the U.S. Surgeon General and the WHO now saying not to wear masks. Yet, arbitrary and confusing regulations are being reinforced on people to wear them around the globe. Draconian, law, draconian laws are being drafted and passed around the world, both for mandatory vaccinations and for a quote-unquote new normal base for social norms, in direct violation of natural human rights and behavior. Viruses are the most abundant microbes on the planet, in our air, soil, and water. They are messenger molecules congruent with exosomes and other extracellular vesicles. Our life processes are totally dependent on them. To even consider vaccines as some sort of savior against a single virus may someday, see, someday be seen as ignorant and medieval bloodletting. True science evolves with the best information available, not to be held back by dogma. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, Thank you very much. Second. And we have Shirley Lang with us by phone. And we're Hello, gonna... can you hear me? We hear you, Shirley. All right, sorry, my camera's not working today. So um, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join. Um, on a final note here, across the nation, police are being told to not apprehend criminals, but instead to arrest parents on playgrounds, to arrest lone surfers on public beaches, to find ministers and congregation members sitting in their cars, listening to a service on the radio, et cetera. People have had enough. They're beginning to see the huge scam this has penetrated in the entire world over a viral infection with a global death rate of 1.4%, meaning 1.4% of the people infected with this SARS-2 have a fatal outcome, while 98.6% recover. This is far fewer deaths than a severe flu season. We're already starting to see the thrust and take our power back. In Virginia, for instance, people went to beaches ignoring in mass social distancing, the orders of the governor to stay home. The central California city of Atwaters declared itself a sanctuary city, allowing business owners and churches to, to openly defy Governor uh, Newsom's stay at home orders. The truth about wearing masks is starting to come out and people are voting with their feet. Retired neurosurgeon Dr. Russell Blaylock warns that not only do face masks fail, to protect healthy people from contracting illnesses, but they create serious health risks to the wearer. I also heard Dr. Fauci say, kind of laughingly say, oh, forget face coverings, they're not gonna work in a pandemic. And here, this is a guy we're listening to who's gone back and forth between wearing one or not wearing one. Um, you know, we, were, we had two weeks to flatten the curve. Well, the curve is flattened and I don't believe all these new numbers, but that we've, we're increasing the testing, yes, but with more increasing, there's going to be more cases. It doesn't mean people are actively infected. The death rate is actually overall going down. And uh, it, this is just getting ridiculous. I'm seeing businesses suffer. I was, I had a girl almost in tears talking to me, waiting at Bed Bath & Beyond as a single mom, worried that with all this going on, she's going to lose her job again. Uh, there's just so much. I see the restaurant owners at, you know, just a quarter of their capacity. They've been shut down, all their blood, sweat, and tears. And they're not able to even, you know, make half the money that they made before to say nothing of their employees. I'm not willing to accept this new normal because there's nothing normal about it. And it's wrong to even consider it. Definitely refuse mandatory uh, vaccination and I won't wear a mask. And I'm not afraid to stand next to family, friend or members or and the concept of social distancing. I'll respect my friends that want to, you know, not hug and stay away. If anyone else wants to wear a mask, by all means, let them. But it should not be uh mandatory. And I also understand that as an asymptomatic carrier, as a normal, healthy person, and I will not buy into the fear, I might catch something. I mean, every year we subject ourselves. It's a flu. It's a doggone flu for Pete's sake. If you're sick, stay home. If you want to wear a mask, stay it. Big surge in cases are meaningless and a falsehood. There's um, the gal before me, Stephanie, mentioned the uh, competing opinions. There's lots out there. Why Thank you, Shirley. Thank you very much. Please consider our comments. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that's it tonight for public comments. Yes. Uh, let us move on to the consent calendar. Is there anyone that would like to pull an item? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Jones. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about 
Uh, 7D. 7D. 7J and uh, 7M. D, J, and M. All right. Uh, can I get a motion for the balance of the consent calendar? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Bob Engler, so moved. All right. We have a motion for uh, the balance of the consent calendar other than D, J, and M. Can I vote on that, please? Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Jones? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bill Delapena? Yes. Mayor Adam? And yes, a yes for me. And that motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Well, shall we start with D? Councilmember Jones. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. We've had uh, at least one complaint about the larger helicopters by one of the neighbors. And I know the, the report said there had been a sound study. I just wondered if, if uh, maybe Mark, I see that uh, Mark Town was the go-to person on 7D. Maybe he'd like to expand on that just a little bit. Uh, Mr. Towner, Mr. Powers, either one, I think, uh, has Mr. knowledge Towner, about his, that. His question was regarding the sound study um, on the helipad uh, item. Sure. And Mr. Mayor, this is Patrick here. Oh, there he is. The Patrick City Sears Attorneys. Sears. Oh, all so right. We yeah. also have uh, six uh, individuals or a number of individuals from the consultant firm uh, from the hospital that are on Zoom for this particular item, if it was called. Um, Briefly, I can say that there was a sound study done just because it was a larger helicopter, but based upon the study that was done, uh, the hearing officer who heard the matter did not find any change that was necessary and therefore moved to approve the project. And so that, that project was approved administratively. So there was a hearing uh, and there was a, a study done, a sound study done but it showed that there wasn't too much of a change uh, due to the limitation of the helicopters that are gonna be going to this location, the Firehawk helicopters. So I'm not sure if that answers completely. All right, um, no, that's fine, Mr. Question. Heher. And Mr. Uh, Powers, can you, I believe you shared with me the average number of flights each year that would be? Yeah, I had the question posed uh, just, uh, just to give the council a sense, uh, 2019, um, they had uh, 14, uh, 14 uh, Ventura County uh, fire helicopters landed 14 times at Los Robles. For, so we're talking just a slightly over one flight a month, correct? All right. Mr. Jones? So, so, so the, the decibels were in a, an acceptable range, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, on 7J, J. Uh, I just would like to review this process for a moment. These are very large contracts. And I know uh, the uh, staff report said that there is a committee that goes through these. I believe it's, you know, quite a large uh, total sum and for a five year period. I was wondering if uh, I see Jamie, Jamie's name is on this uh, or whomever would like to explain a little bit the the, uh, the process since we are talking uh, about very large contracts here. Sure, Councilmember Jones. While we're pulling the right staff person uh, up on the screen, just to reiterate, you know, we have uh, existing. Uh, processes and procedures for review of, uh, of RFP, RFQ uh, bid processes, but I'll let them speak to the specifics of uh, this one, which is in regard to janitorial services. Liz Perez. Okay, good evening, um, Council Member Jones. This is Liz Perez, Facilities Manager. So um, we went out for a formal uh, request for proposals, and because janitorial covers so many facilities, we actually had a committee of seven so we had representatives from the Hill Canyon Treatment Plant, the service yard, library, two from theaters, um, plus uh, city hall staff. So we had a very large committee. We interviewed, um, I don't know, three or four, four um, uh, companies. And uh, this is the one EFS, they actually work with Canal Park and Rec District. They came with really great um, references and they were, uh, slightly higher than our uh, current budget, but that was one of the reasons we actually went out for an RFP. 
is because with um, minimum wage going up, a lot of the pricing was gonna go up. So we decided it was a good time to go out and see what was out there with new companies. So we went through the formal process, uh, checked references, and uh, EFS was the one who came out on top. The number does uh, shock people, but it is over 13 locations with multiple buildings, over 300,000 square feet of cleaning. So that's a lot of space to clean. Um, the numbers also looks high because this includes all janitory at all facilities. Uh, Cavley is closed and forum. So of course there won't be any theater expenses till January probably. Um, Newbury Park Library is closed, but we did put that numbers in the uh, staff report and the budget just in case. You never know what might happen. So we wanna make sure that we're covered in case the, those buildings are able to open up earlier. So went through the formal process. Uh, this was the uh, firm that came to the top. And um, if you have any other questions, I'm here to ask. Have we had any experience with this firm in the past? The city hasn't in particular, but I think the park district has worked with them for many years, many years. Well, it sounds like a very thorough process. And I just, if we're gonna do it for that period of time and involving not much money, I just uh, want to reassure myself and the public that uh, we're doing the best we can to get them, uh, you know, the best uh, uh, conscientious type work uh, uh, for the best price. So that was my only question. Thank you about that. Okay, great. And, and I have one more item, Mr. Mayor. Yes, M. That's M. I just wonder, this balance that we have left over from the uh, the, the public authority we used to have, I, I noticed, is eight million seven hundred ninety thousand dollars. Do I understand correctly that the tax increment is going to continue relative to death to any debt that is left in these uh, facilities from the time they were? Uh, uh, discontinued is is that still going to be paid by the tax rate or or do we have to use any sources of funds to retire that miss Boscarino can answer that question for you good evening mayor adam council members um mr jones to your point as long as the debt is outstanding the tax increment will be going to pay off the debt once the debt um, matures and is no longer outstanding, then that tax increment will then be redistributed out to all of the um, entities that receive the property tax for the city, including CRPD and the fire district, school district, and the city itself. Is that true of, of all of the redevelopment agencies? When they were uh, discontinued, they still had access to that tax increment long enough to, to pay off what it what existing debt still uh, was uh, there and, and uh, needed to be paid? Uh, that is my understanding of the law. I just wanted to make sure we didn't have to dip into the general fund to, to take care of what, uh, the, you know, whatever was left from the redevelopment agency. No, we, we certainly much, will Mr. not. Martin. All right. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, well, Mr. Jones, would you care to move? Uh, DJ and I'll move 7D, uh, 7, um, J and 7M. All right, motion on the floor, uh, vote please. Council Member Angler? Yes. Council Member Jones? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bill De La Pena? Yes. Mayor Adam? Yes. And that motion carries four to zero. Thank you. All right, we have a department report this evening on our solid waste franchise request for proposal. And Dr. Helen Cox, our sustainability manager, will give that report. And I think it's great that we have a sustainability manager here in the city of Thousand Oaks. Microphone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good evening and uh, to members of the council. I'm here this evening to provide an overview of the request for proposals for solid waste service in the city. And I'm joined on the dais by Cliff Finley, Director of Public Works. Our consultant, Richard Tagore Irwin, President and CEO of R3 Consulting Group is joining us by video conference. 
Council set the development of a sustainability strategic plan as one of its top 10 priorities for this fiscal year. A key component of this addresses how our waste is handled. As Council directed earlier this year, staff in consultation with R3 have developed a request for proposals, or RFP, for an exclusive solid waste franchise to serve the city. We're here tonight to present an overview of that document and seek your approval to issue this solicitation. One of the key elements of the new waste services will be the provision of organics recycling to all residents and businesses. This is a requirement under the state's new law, SB 1383, which becomes effective at the start of 2022. For residents, it will mean adding food waste to existing yard waste carts. Haulers will need to arrange for processing at permitted organics processing facilities. Almost all businesses will be required to subscribe to organic service. This is new. Currently, businesses that generate less than a large cart's worth of organic waste per week are exempted, but under new law, exemptions are virtually eliminated. To ensure that the city is in compliance with the state's laws on mandatory commercial recycling and mandatory organics recycling, business service will be bundled under the new contract. Businesses subscribing to solid waste service will receive a garbage bin, a recycling bin of the same size, and an organics cart. They will also have the option to modify the basic bundle package to meet their needs. Residents will continue to receive the same basic bundle service that they currently receive, a 64-gallon garbage cart, a 64-gallon recycling cart, and a 96-gallon green waste cart, to which they will be able to add food waste. Under the new contract, residents will receive new carts that are in standard colors, black or gray for trash, green for organics, and blue for recycling. Commercial bins will all be newly painted in these same standard colors. This will provide consistency throughout the city and also consistency with most other cities. Contractors will be required to use clean fuel vehicles to reduce their impact on emissions, and vehicles will be equipped with technology, including GPS for locating and tracking vehicles in real time, and cameras for recording the contents of loads. This will be necessary for monitoring contamination of recycling and organics containers, and help the city to meet the strict compliance requirements. The contractor will be required to conduct extensive outreach and education on organics and recycling to all residents and businesses, with a focus on helping everyone to understand how to recycle properly. The contractor will also be required to conduct site visits to all businesses and multifamily complexes every year. The contractor will be required to maintain a minimum recycling rate which is established by the city. This is based on the material that the hauler collects and diverts from the landfill. This will help the city to meet its state mandated diversion rate. The selected contractor must provide residents with three free landfill day events annually. These have always been popular with our community. In addition, we're adding recycling bins to our public trash bin locations throughout the city, and the contractor will service up to 90 of these locations. The contractor will be required to offer employment to all qualified displaced employees of the city's current two franchisees. Contractors must retain these displaced employees for at least 90 days. The current practice of street sweeping will continue under the new contract. Under the RFP, proposers will submit proposals to provide home collection of household hazardous waste quarterly to residents. The cost of this program will be included in the service rates. The city will have the option of whether or not to include this program in the final agreement. 
Additionally, proposers will be asked to submit their proposals for cleaning out the city's storm drain inlets. The cost of this service will be folded into service rates, and again, the city will have the option of whether or not to include this program in the final agreement. A single citywide service provider will result in the best value to the city ratepayers because it will minimize service costs and maximize efficiency by avoiding duplication of services, by optimizing vehicle routes, and by reducing overhead costs such as administration and billing. It will also provide for the highest accountability by holding a single entity responsible for reporting, compliance, and meeting diversion standards. And it will provide citywide consistency for services, scheduling, rates, outreach, and customer service. The evaluation process for proposals includes an initial pass-fail review, followed by a detailed evaluation and scoring by the evaluation team, based on a number of criteria including qualifications, financial resources and stability, technical approach, plans and schedule, sustainability, diversion, outreach, customer service, and rates. The planned schedule is as shown here, with the RFP to be released next week, a proposal due date of October 15th, an award recommendation to be brought to council in early spring 2021, and new service to begin January 1st, 2022. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. We're available along with our consultant to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cox. And, and just a, a quick point of clarity. Residents may be wondering, you know, why can't I just throw my uh, um, organic waste in the garbage like I've always done, you know, whether it be banana peels or <laughs> vegetable remnants, whatever that happens to be. And here's why. Uh, because right now, those remnants end up in landfills in which they decompose and they create gas, I believe it's methane gas, which then seeps out of the landfills into the atmosphere and becomes a greenhouse gas that cont contributes to global warming. And as you can imagine, uh, with all these landfills all across the state, this is, this is significant, this amount of this gas. So the state of California, I think wisely, has said that by 2024, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to recycle these, these materials, um, either through composting or a number of other different methods. Did I get that right, Dr. Cox? Yes, you did. Okay, very good. So we live and learn as we go along in this process. Now, with that... Uh, if I may, I'd like to see if my fellow council members have any questions. Mayor Bob Engler here. Council Member Engler, hello. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cox, um, I'm wondering, in terms of how we're going to make this choice, uh, there's, there's some vendors that have very distant uh, um, landfill dumps or very, very distant uh, recycling areas. Um, is that going to be part of our evaluation, the, the amount of uh, energy it's going to take to move our trash to locations, or is there, is there uh, some feel for that that you can give me? Uh, yes, that will be part of the evaluation. One of the criteria will be looking at the facilities that um, the proposers are proposing to use for disposal and for recycling and for organics processing, and the footprint that's associated with the traffic going the vehicles going to those will be part of the consideration. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Engler, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I just wonder in this whole process, uh, at this point in time, should we try to give some guidance in this process or do we wait until the culmination of the process to give our opinion? You want to take that, Mr. Powers? Well, I just, I mean, I, and I'll look to um, uh, 
Tracy, uh, oh, in terms this of just real clarification, well. uh, regard, right now what's before the council is the issuance of, uh, of an RFP. Right, so uh, to answer your question, Council Member Jones, if, if you have um, guidance or direction that you think is important for staff to consider as they issue the RFP, then tonight is an appropriate time to talk about that guidance and those requests and suggestions that you have. Um, for example, as, as Council Member Engler talked about, he asked whether we would consider how far away you know, vendors' facilities are. Staff indicated yes, that that would be a criteria. Excuse me, uh, I can't quite hear you. Could you maybe speak into the mic a little better? Sure, can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, sorry about that. So if, if you have questions or guidance or suggestions on what you think would be appropriate for staff to consider in issuing this RFP and considering proposals to this RFP, tonight would be the time to talk about that. And as an example, I was mentioning Councilmember Engler's uh, question regarding consideration of how far away a vendor's facilities are. Staff indicates that that will be taken into consideration. So if that is something that's important, it's important you know, for you, that is something you can mention tonight as well. Well, what, what concern I have is that We've always had some competition, not direct in the sense that somebody could step into somebody else's district. But originally we divided the city into three parts and then uh, a large company bought out two of the three and combined them. So now we have two parts. Uh, if this goes forward, uh, in some of the conversations I've had with staff, I'm of the impression that it is felt that it, it may be more economical and, and I don't know if there are other values uh, that have been uh, mentioned uh, to perhaps end up with one hauler for the whole city. That, you know, I don't know if it's feasible to have districts as we had originally, uh, but I've always liked the idea of competition. I don't, I don't like the idea of monopolies, just as a general principle. And I, I don't know if any, if there's any sympathy <laughs> for that uh, notion on behalf of the other, or on the part of anybody else on the council, but. It seems to me, as a general matter, when you get monopolies, sometimes uh, th that can lead to excesses and and uh, you know lack of uh, without a feeling of competition. I I wonder if perhaps a, a uh, you know a, a situation can develop where we get less than the best of the one person or one company that may be involved. I know that the gentleman that was our consultant before spoke of the fact that San Jose, which I know is much larger now than Thousand Oaks, was divided into districts. Would it be feasible to, to in our counseling right now with the uh, uh, process, with our whatever, uh, input we might be giving tonight to mention the fact that it might be wise to have more than one citywide district. Would this be the appropriate time to mention that if you wanted to, Mr. Uh, Manager? Absolutely, and, and we'll have our consultant uh, speak to, to those points and, and uh, sort of why the recommendation is what it is right now. Yes, uh, this is Richard Tagore Irwin with R3. Can you speak? a little louder, please. Yes, this is Richard Tagore Irwin with R3 Consulting, and our recommendation is really a, a single citywide service provider for the city of Thousand Oaks. It will give your residents and your business community the best value. It will provide the, the least wear and tear on your streets. It will provide the best environmental protection for the city by reducing the number of traffic, you know, truck traffic. It will provide an easier uh, system for the city to manage a very complex contract and it will provide a much better way for the city to hold a single service provider accountable and have the city uh, in a, a stronger position for compliance with state law. So 
So that, that is our recommendation as a single citywide service provider. The competition comes from this RFP process. That's when you're going to get your competition. Yeah, well, this may be irrelevant, but we have two very large electricity monopolies in California, PG&E and Edison, and they both just paid out huge sums of money because evidently instead of insulating their lines and doing all the things they should have been doing with whatever money they had, they paid it off in profits to their shareholders and and so forth. And I don't like the idea of monopolies. I don't know if, if that has relevance to what we're talking about tonight, but just because you can have economies, it doesn't necessarily say, you know, do you follow my logic? Are you familiar with the billions of dollars that PG&E and, and, and Edison have paid out because of their uh, lack of uh, keeping their, their uh, process, their lines, their equipment up to date? I think you're aware of that, aren't you? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just jump in on one quick you know, one quick point of this. So uh, for, as a reminder to the council and to the public, uh, when you create a contract, especially a contract of this magnitude, it's built around performance standards. And those performance standards are carefully crafted with industry best practices that give Dr. Cox and the public works team the ability to manage the contract uh, throughout the course of time. And uh, in the comparison, you were giving Council Member Jones of, uh, of uh, you know, inadequate maintenance of uh, some element of infrastructure. Um, we actually require performance standards on the quality and type of truck that's utilized as one example. Um, and the, the, the service uh, production elements, there are a litany of requirements that are laid out within the performance standards within a, in a contract. In, in coming back to the uh, question around um, um, Competition. You know, it's important to, to recognize the main when the council had an they had an opportunity back in December to consider uh, whether we wanted to do an RFP or not do an RFP, and uh, we put forward the best negotiated rate that uh, staff was able to get at that at that time. And once they uh, and the and the council looked at that rate, understood there was going to be some increases, much of which was driven by the by the market. And the RFP was an option that was put before you as well. This is the first time we've done an RFP for this service. It is a significant service and it is an ever-evolving service. And uh, the, from consultation with the industry professionals here, our main concern is ensuring the highest quality service at the best rate for our customers. And that best rate is spread across the broadest basis of households and businesses. And if we uh, bifurcate, and uh, in talking to the, the professionals on this, if you bifurcate that, then you are short cycling the market in terms of what you may be able to receive from, uh, from a, an aggressive rate from the waste haulers. Uh, Mr. Finley, do you have anything to add to that, or Dr. Cox? I, <coughs> thank you, Drew. I believe, I believe you covered it. I have a follow-on comment. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Jones. I, 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 I obviously, the, the comparison I made was not you know, nearly an exact comparison. But, you know, it seems to me that the State Utilities Commission should have taken a much stronger hand in analyzing the quality of the lines of the electric providers in California. But I think I hear the city manager uh, saying that, that we could, that we would not let any of uh, their trucks or any of their equipment or any any vital uh, part of their uh, service get into disrepair, that we would have the ability to step in if that ever happened. Is that right? Yeah, that is, that is correct on, on basically all aspects uh, of the service. Um, one of the points that I did want to stress and mention, I think it was mentioned in the presentation, but it bears mentioning here. Uh, by doing a market-based look at this, we are not precluding 
operators from potentially subcontracting uh, within this. And so in that scenario, we may see bids that involve, uh, and we likely would anticipate bids that involve multiple uh, subcontractors. For instance, uh, we've long had street sweeping as part of our agreement, and uh, that street sweeping has been provided by a subcontractor uh, because it's not in the core business of one of the waste uh, haulers. And so we would anticipate any uh, proposals that we see will likely have subcontractors that could be on the, the waste, recycling, um, composting, or street sweeping or other elements of the contract. I just wanted to could, add one. Could we have in the contract that you could either bid on the entire city or part of the city? So if I can answer that question. So the recommendation from staff is to bid on the entire contract. And I wanted to kind of touch upon the conversation um, and the comments that you made, Council Member Jones, regarding uh, what we currently have in the city. Right now, we currently have two operators that provide um, solid waste services to the city. And it is separated um, among, you know, geographically in the city. Um, however, I want to be clear, make sure the council understands that that geographic distinction does not result in, for lack of a better word, competition among the two operators. In other words, um, residents who live in the geographic location where waste management provides services cannot contract with Harrison to come and provide those services because Harrison is in a different district. And I just want to make sure that council understands that there is no crossover among the two providers that we currently are under contract with right now. So um, if, if um, in, in talking about your concern over monopolization, um, as a consultant indicated, the competition is really at the RFP process, is really about the RFP process, and it's no different than the uh, arrangement and the contracts that we have with both Waste Management and Harrison right now. Yes, uh, Ms. Madam Attorney, I understand that, that, that you couldn't go into somebody else's territory. My thinking was more on the terms of if we went out for a shorter period of time uh, and one, uh, you know, provider or hauler w was showing up to be much better than another one, uh, we might have the opportunity to, to uh, you know, to give that person both districts if we had districts. That would be the only way that I would see competition. I realized you couldn't have a waste management hauler go in and do a few people in Harrison's district or vice versa. What would it, my question again was, would it be possible or would the council be interested in wording the RFP that a company could bid on not only the whole city, but a part of the city. So well, let's uh, go to Mayor Pro Tem and see what she is thinking. But to answer, but to answer Ed's question, if if the council, whatever council, if council wants to give direction, um, the staff recommendation is before you based on our work with the industry cons uh, industry uh, expert and consultant on here. If the council chooses to to provide uh, additional or different direction, uh, we'll absolutely incorporate that. Just to answer Councilmember Jones' question. All right. Very good. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Adam. Uh, I needed a refresher. Uh, how long was the contract going to be if we went um, after this RFP? Um, 15 years with a possible years, two five-year extensions possible beyond that. Okay. And say we will have, we encounter some problems with whomever we are choosing um, in the first 15 years. What are our avenues? How can, how do we address, is there, will there be a clause to separate the, uh, the city from this contract? Um, we have a number of penalties for small, um, smaller violations or for actions that can be corrected and there they will be listed in the contract. If there are major violations that will be um, grounds for terminating the contract. Right, we'll have the standard default and breach language in the contract in addition to the penalty provisions. So if there are significant performance 
issues or violations and the city will have the option to terminate the contract. Okay. Uh, and I'm actually quite relieved to hear uh, Ms. Noonan explain, uh, well, not relieved, but she made an obvious point that the, even though we have two providers in the city, doesn't really establish competition because of the separate districts. So I think that is very important. I think what council member Jones is getting at is, for example, the we have two providers for internet service, Verizon and Frontier. And one of them has been very problematic. The other one, maybe not so much. And, and so, but as with the, 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 the utility companies regulated by the CPUC, we don't have as much control over electricity or even the cable companies as we would have over the waste haulers. So the waste haulers, we will have complete control over. The others are really out of our reach and, and we have very limited input in, in that. And I do understand that it would make more sense to have one provider who will probably or likely subcontract some of the services to other providers in the area. And given the fact, as has been mentioned numerous times, that we have not gone out for an RFP in, for, in really since we started this, this is really crucial to get a better picture of the services available. I do believe that we owe it to our residents, both residential as well as commercial, to deliver to them the best price, the best service as well. And Mayor thank, Pro you, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Well, Mayor Pro Tem, if I may, might just add on, on to uh, a couple of the comments that you've made. Really, and you referenced the, uh, the two areas of city that have had different providers. That's really emblematic of how this service has evolved over the course of time in that the, um, uh, we had legacy services, uh, it, it, even what uh, Councilmember Jones was mentioning in the early days of, of the city with multiple haulers and the ability to select an individual hauler. Uh, and the world of trash recycling and now compostables is evolving pretty pretty dramatically. And what's before you is really forward looking in that there, whoever comes in is going to have to make substantial investments in uh, waste hauling, recycling, and uh, composting in Thousand Oaks. Now, one example of that states mandating new trash cans, and that'll have to factor in with with the uh, contract. And uh, those new trash cans, you multiply out the cost of that associated with all the residential addresses and commercial addresses, is is substantial. So that length of time that we're talking about there, part of that is uh, is the. Um, uh, attempt to get a magic formula to have the right rate structure uh, to get someone to come in and bid with the best rate for our residents and our businesses given the investments that they're going to have to make. That, ten, that number of, of customers and that length of time in the contract are part of the, the magic ingredients to uh, try to get the best rate. Mm -hmm. Council Member Angler, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Really, I have uh, just two, two questions. Um, uh, the comments I think we can have later as we get, have our discussion phase of our, our, our uh, item here. Um, one, um, I was relieved to hear uh, and see that um, I, I have two concerns. One of them is the current employees of each company, making mm -hmm. sure that uh, those employees who have been servicing our, our, our citizens for all these years uh, faithfully and well are also uh, considered within our contract. And I understand that um, the uh, current employees will be offered uh, further employment with whatever contractor we uh, hire for this, for this task. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. And then in terms of, in terms of the um, scale of the operation, is, is most of our savings that we could hope to um, get from this new contract that we have put in that bid. It's a very large amount of money over an extended period of time. Um, is the scale that we are offering with a contract uh, that where we're getting most of our 
our um, savings or most of the incentive for contractors to bid. Um, <clears throat> let me take this as Cliff Finley. Um, actually, the length of time allows those capital expenses to be amortized over a further distance or, or amount of time, which reduces the overhead costs required on an annual basis. That is probably, uh, and, and some surety for that contractor knowing if I make an investment in Thousand Oaks and I follow the contract and I do a good job, uh, I'm going to be there for 15 years. And that is worth uh, significant cost savings to our residents. So if, if we go with the single contractor with the extended period of time, then we would uh, have our best chance of getting the least um, rates charged to our, uh, to our citizens? Uh, that is what our uh, industry professional represent, uh, recommends, and, and we believe that to be true as well. Thank you. All right. Mr. Uh, Mayor. Yes, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, what about the commercial? Is If we go with the uh, recommended action here, will, will the uh, citywide commercial to be part of the uh, contract? Yes, it's included all residential and commercial. Because I know that uh, I don't believe Harrison has any commercial right now. Not but in Thousand, uh, not in Thousand Oaks, but they do in other cities. Yes, I know. I meant Thousand Oaks. Uh, so that what's on the table then is everything, and the idea is everything for one hauler, one one company, all of the residential hall to commercial, is that correct? That's correct. Well, you know, I appreciate <laughs> your <laughs> talking about the uh, economy and letting them advertise it over 15 years and everything. Uh, and so we would uh, adopt a contract that would make it, make it feasible for them to do that and get the best equipment and and uh, as Councilman Angler says, and and uh, use experience to haulers. I like that idea that he brought up that people would be able to keep their work. But you know, you can think about this the other way around. <laughs> they become very uh, good. They become uh, very well equipped and with everything. But the bigger it gets, the more we're also dependent on them. I mean, if we didn't like it, the bigger <laughs> the contract, the harder it would be, wouldn't it, for some other company to come in and take over? Wouldn't it be easier if they could uh, take it over in, in more than one section? I don't know who I'm asking then. Maybe it's rhetorical, you know what I mean? It's a hypothetical question, but uh, would anybody care to tackle that, Mr. Finley? Yes. Uh, yeah, we believe, uh, Councilmember Jones, that um, though though we like to believe that Thousand Oaks is a, a very large city, uh, we are only a city of 130,000. And that is well within the means of any of our existing haulers to take over the entire city or, or not, and, and lots of other haulers out there as well. So we believe the size of our community, if we were dissatisfied with the hauler that's selected, uh, that there will be plenty of other haulers that could come in and take over that work for us. They'd and uh, Cliff, do you think that we might get, get some indication of the accuracy of that, uh, of your statement by the number of uh, people that we may get bidding in the instant contract we're talking about right now? That's correct. Do you have any idea of how many companies may bid? Probably between three let, and let five. Me, uh, um, let me address that one. I mean, you've got, um, you're in a fairly strong market area, so there are multiple haulers, whether it is Waste Management, Harrison, Athens, CRNR, Republic, all of them are reputable and can provide 
provide a good proposal for you and it, it really does enhance the competition that you're going to have going forward. Um, and that is really the basis of, of going through a competitive process is to invite as many companies as you possibly can into that process. All right. Uh, tell you what, if there's no further questions, we do have the speaker and then we can go back to council discussion. How would that be? Let us go to our speaker then, and that is Mike Smith. Hello, good evening, am I on? Uh, we hear you. Do okay. we see you? Do we have Mike on video? Okay, start. Oh, telephone participation, go ahead, Mike. We got you. Okay, how about now, am I on the video now? You're good, uh, we hear you and that's, that's fine. All right, I just gotta get to the- And now you're on video. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Mike Smith, the Director of Operations for Waste Management. I've had the pleasure of serving this community for the past 45 years. And as your primary waste hauler in the Thousand Oaks area, we, uh, we do that with great pride. Uh, we've worked with each and every one of you on the dais, you know, in previous lifetimes, Ed, and others for many years. And we've continued to work with, you know, your amazing staff over the years and different city managers for so many years as well. And we, we respect your commitment to the residents and businesses of Thousand Oaks. Um, you, you, have a, you do an incredible job for the cities and the citizens over here. You work so hard at it. We like to think that we're right there with you. We like to feel like we're part of the infrastructure as well. And we respect the way take care of the community and we work for you. So we like to think that we do the same. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to highlight the great work that we've done over the past half a century and uh, with the plans for the future and the ever-changing world that we're living in today. You know, who'd have thought that we'd have experienced these things, at least in, in the world and in Thousand Oaks that we have in the last two years. Um, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Cox, there are many things that are continuously changing in the state with respect to recycling, diversion, and processes. And uh, in Sacramento, and we know those are going to be starting soon, and some have already started. There is no waste hauler in the country better equipped to do this than waste management. We've got the resources. We've got an incredible team. We've got the local resources in the landfill and recycling center. So we think we're in a really great position uh, to move forward with the uh, requests and the future demands of the city. And on a personal note, uh, you know, I've been 45 years with the company, which I say proudly. I've got all of my, per my professional career here in this community working for this city. And I'm extremely proud of the partnership that we've had together with the city of Thousand Oaks, all the accomplishments. Uh, you know, in our case, so 80,000 plus pickups a week that we do in the city of Thousand Oaks. And we've seen the results of the city's surveys and we're very proud to be partners with the city of Thousand Oaks. And we're looking forward to continuing that relationship. So we thank you for your time and look forward to working with staff through this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we can now go to council discussion on this issue. Who would like to kick it off? We've already kind of discussed this, but we can continue. Mr. Mayor, Bob Engler. I, I, yes, Council Member Engler. See if I get the first word in here. Go right ahead. Um, the, I, I appreciate uh, both our, our current uh, our vendors, um, Harrison and uh, Waste Management are, have both been very uh, responsive and, and very good for our citizens. Uh, however, as as um, going back to our discussion a few months ago, this is a very large uh, franchise that we are going to award. And w in my opinion, we really have to put it out to an RFP to see uh, what is the best deal we can get for our citizens. Uh, according to our testimony tonight, uh, the best way we can do that is with a uh, one vendor who will uh, be at least a master franchisee for the city. Uh, they can they can accomplish that goal however they want, uh, hiring different vendors, however they feel like uh, accomplishing that goal. But then we will have just the one vendor to deal with. 
Um, and because of bringing up or uh, having them uh, be our one vendor, we then can accomplish a, uh, a scale of uh, uh, a scale of economy there that will um, allow us to get the best deal. I think that that really is my uh, bottom line. Will will it give our citizens the the best bang for their buck? Uh, and uh, I, I've got to go with our our uh, vendors and staff saying that this is probably the best way to do it. So I think I would lean toward uh, going out with the RFP as presented by staff with a single vendor, as long as that vendor accomplishes the goal that we need them to accomplish uh, over time. And the, they take care of the, uh, the current um, employees uh, and, and bring them along one way or the other. Uh, I wanna make sure that all, all our bases, our, our employees are, or the uh, vendor's employees are taken care of and our citizens are taken care of at the same time. So that's kind of the way I'm coming down on it. Uh, I'd love to hear what uh, my other colleagues are have to say. Is that a motion, Council Member Engler? Just discussion at this point. All uh, right, very good. I understand completely. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to add in? I would like to, yes, uh, Mayor Adam, thank w you. Wonderful. The, I think what makes this proposal for an RFP so strong, unlike other, unlike other proposals, one second, <laughs> sorry. You have a little friend with you. And there goes Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Okay, she'll, I'm, be, I'm back. I'm she'll be back, I'm sure. Uh, the dog ate makes, my homework. No, <laughs> not okay. yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, what, uh, my apologies, what makes us different and I think what makes this strong as well, unlike any previous RFPs the city has considered, Mr. M Mr. Jones, I'd like to emphasize that to Mr. Jones is that we will require, we will require, you know, what can we, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to take a quick break, sorry. That's all right. You go ahead and uh, why don't we uh, go to Mr. Jones then? And Claudia well, will be back in just a moment. Sure, I think I've said enough. I I think my position is clear. I, I would say so, I'm yes. Gonna, I'm gonna reluctantly, if, if there is a motion, I will somewhat reluctantly support it. All right. Although I don't like monopolies. And and I, I know that uh, we'll have conscientious, talented people develop this RFP. And the idea is to have it so uh, airtight or whatever the right expression is, uh, that uh, we'll have uh, control over this. So I ask a question, if, if we're not satisfied with, with any of the bids, uh, do, I presume we have the opportunity to reject them and, and advertise again, is that correct? Uh, yes, Ms. Jones, we do. However, if you recall, um, this is an RFP process, so we actually uh, have the opportunity to to negotiate with the the vendor I who see. is closest to us. So we have a we have input then with the various proposals that they make. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm not going to speak further. I'm going to somewhat reluctantly vote for the. RFP, uh, and I won't uh, reiterate my feeling about monopolies. All right. I think that's probably well understood by now. All right. Well, we'll have get a motion on the floor, uh, okay. ultimately, and Mayor Pro Tem's back. Yes, no, I'm right here. Go right I'm, ahead. I'm back, if I may, Mr. Mayor. You may. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Jones. I, what I wanted to say is that this pro um, proposal for an RFP is different from previous ones in that we will require 
whoever wins the bid to hire employees that are currently working in the industry locally here. I think that is very important. And then secondarily is that we will have complete control over the contract. We are not beholden to a state agency. We will have our own rules. We can force them. We can impose penalties if need be. So I think that gives me a peace of mind. I do understand with monopoly. Um, I completely agree with you on that, Mr. Jones. In this case, I think we it will behoove us to deliver the best service to the residents of Thousand Oaks. And this process, I hope, will do that. So with that, I would like to move staff recommendation. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. And, and I will just say that uh, this whole RFP process is without a doubt in the best benefit of the residents of Thousand Oaks. It's met with uh, considerable positive resident feedback if they've, if they've as they have followed us through this process. Um, if you recall when we first started, uh, because of all these new state regulations, we were all a little bit alarmed at some of the uh, potential rise in costs uh, for these services, and I think that's what prompted this RFP to begin with. But, you know, a request for proposal really is the definition of competition, and as you've heard, there could be as many as five haulers bidding on this. And when I listened to Mike Smith, I could see his competitive juices already coming to the fore. So I think uh, the very process itself will ensure that the residents get the, the best possible service for the best possible price. And I, I really think what the one contract is, is in the, the best interest of our residents. One responsible party that we deal with, and, and they may, may well subcontract. In fact, I would suspect that's what may happen. So we may end up with more than one hauler. But one responsible party, I think, is best for the city and best for our residents. And as far as um, accountability, uh, that's the other thing that the RFP does. We can build in benchmarks for performance in an RFP that we don't have now, but we will have once this process is over. And that's going to ensure that we get great service and the negotiability on these things is quite high. As, as the proposals may, we can go through it line by line and look at ways that we can save money for our residents. So there's, there's a lot of latitude there for us to get a great deal for everyone. So, so I would be in favor of the uh, one contract. And I think we have a motion on the floor to that very uh, extent. So if there's no further discussion, I believe we can vote on that. Councilmember Angler? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bill De La Pena? Yes. Mayor Adam? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0. All right. Thank you all. That is our primary issue for the evening. Uh, let's see if our city manager has any follow up. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Adam. Uh, this is our um, final meeting before our annual summer recess, uh, meaning that our next city council meeting will be on Tuesday, the 25th of August. Um, I do feel compelled just briefly to uh, reiterate again after a few of the public comments on the, on, uh, the front side of our, our meeting this evening. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but I work uh, extremely closely within our system of governance with uh, medical professionals and public health professionals, and um, the um, them and our local hospital providers are on the front lines every day, uh, providing us with uh, the data and the facts and the science uh, behind uh, what's happening. And it is an ever-evolving situation uh, when we look back to March as we were combating uh, COVID, uh, we had very, very little testing. And uh, now we've been able to test tens of thousands of uh, residents and, and continue to uh, be able to do so. Um, and, and that number continues to grow capacity-wise. Um, it's important 
that folks are, are uh, focused on on the fact and the and the science and the and the scientific consensus uh, that is out there. Um, and uh, I think everyone's collective goal here as a society is to try to get ourselves bridge ourselves back to a uh, to a period of time where we can uh, return to normalcy. And that's not where we are today. And so uh, all of our actions, all of our focus, all of our collaborative efforts with our county partners and, and otherwise is aimed at trying to protect public health and trying to support our businesses and trying to bridge us back to a uh, to a place uh, of uh, normalcy. Uh, you had asked a question um, earlier, um, Mayor Adam, about the Newbury Park uh, testing facility. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, is uh, the, uh, the times for that lo uh, location. There is the closest drive through location is over uh, at Moore Park College. Uh, all the details uh, on that are available online. Um, so our next meeting, like I said, 25th of, uh, of August. Um, obviously, that's a ways out, so our agenda is still taking shape uh, for that evening. Um, but uh, just uh, want to wish everyone a safe uh, and uh, happy um, month here ahead. Thank you, Mr. Powers. And just to add to that, I, I'm stating the, I, what I think is the obvious. COVID-19 is a contagious disease. It is persistent and it is on the upswing at the moment. Uh, it particularly affects seniors and pe people uh, with vulnerable uh, conditions. And it's just all of our social responsibility to do what we can to try to contain this virus to protect people around us. And I think that uh, we're all doing a, a fairly good job at that. And we may have to do it for a little longer than we thought. So let's keep up the good work. And now we have a uh, closed session announcement from Ms. Noonan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. We do, we do have one closed session matter. It is a conference with legal counsel for potential initiation of litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.94. Thank you very much. And this evening, we are going to adjourn in the memory of a, of a very good man and a friend of mine, Richard Williams. Uh, Richard was a prominent resident and leader in our arts community. He passed away on June 6th. He was a longtime community resident in Newbury Park, and he was a chemical engineer for Rocketdyne, but he spent his spare time serving as a member and past chair for the Rotary Club of Thousand Oaks, and he was a fixture at the annual Rotary Street Fair. And he dedicated his time to the annual Midsummer Eve Wine Festival, which raised funds to benefit the Venturi, Ventura County Special Olympics. It was Richard's devotion to our local arts community that cemented his legacy as an invaluable and cherished member of our city. Richard and his wife Elaine were co-chairs of the Thousand Oaks Arts Festival. He believed that hands-on arts enrichment was a key component to a successful and strong community and for more than a decade, the Arts Festival showcased the talent of Conejo Valley art and artisans. It was an annual event which was held on the grounds of the Civic Arts Plaza and included visual artists, live performances, and art experiences for children. When the festival ended in 2016, the accumulated sponsored funds were reimagined by Richard to create an arts scholarship endowment with the Arts Council of the Conejo Valley. Richard was a board member and past chair for the Alliance for the Arts, and he organized a variety of events, including the Arts 5K Fun Run and Golf Tournament in support of arts education. He was also a key member of the transition team, which created the Thousand Oaks Alliance for the Arts. Richard's influence on our local art community will be felt for generations to come. We mourn Richard's passing and extend sincere condolences to his family, to his friends, and to his wife, Elaine. And I will say that Richard was a lover of the arts and a fierce and tenacious protector of the arts and a formidable force here in the city when it comes to maintaining our arts and our art culture. And we thank you, Richard, for all that you have done for our city. And now we're going to adjourn this meeting. Uh, we'll be back with you August 25th. In the meantime, 
Enjoy the summer as best we can, stay safe, and we'll see you in a month or so.